everyone. Welcome to our session, The Value of Early Adoption of Negative Pressure Wound Therapy with Installation on Economics, Efficiency, and Patient Outcomes. This is um, supported by an educational grant from 3M Healthcare, the Medical Solutions Division. My name is Liz Faust. I am a certified wound ostomy continence nurse practitioner uh, out of Tower Health System in West Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, and joining me is Dr. Mark Matthews. We have listed our disclosures here. During this session, we'd really like to um, share with you just how the early adoption of negative pressure wound therapy of insulation and dwell can be on the efficiency, on the economics, and patient outcomes. There's recently been a meta-analysis, and we're going to dive into that literature to discuss the outcomes on patients and those receiving both negative pressure wound therapy and um, negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell. And we're really going to use um, that literature and our cases to kind of marry the two together to translate the findings into our clinical practice so that you can see how the literature is supporting what we're seeing clinically and vice versa. So the early initiation of negative pressure wound therapy has been something that has been studied um, for many years. So this isn't new literature, but this lays the background of what we're going to talk about today. So the benefits of early initiation of negative pressure wound therapy on both acute and chronic wounds has been demonstrated to um, improve patient outcomes in both acute care, long-term care, and home health uh, care. When they did a retrospective analysis, negative pressure wound therapy, when it was initiated early in a wound care center, center setting, the treatment time period compared with late initiation. And when I say um, early initiation, it's within the first seven days of the wound treatment. Um, late initiation occurred after um, seven days of an acute wound or 30 days for a chronic wound. Um, but when you compare the two, the mean days to reach closure was significantly less. So there was 75% uh, surface wound area reduction. It's half the time for acute wounds and a third of the time for chronic wounds. So additionally, the early group was twice as likely to reach 75% wound surface area reduction as the late group in both the acute and chronic wounds. So as a summary, acute and chronic wounds can both benefit from simple negative pressure wound therapy. And when we looked at this, it also reduced the inpatient days for acute and intensive care unit by at least 50%. It reduced inpatient days in long-term acute care by 30%, home health length of stay by 34% for surgical wounds, and 49% home health length of stay for pressure injuries. So you can see um, there's four studies here that really showed the difference between early and late initiation, meaning that it may not be a therapy that you have to wait for. Um, you want to start the advanced therapy early on. Um, the European Wound Management Association has a document that was published in 2017 titled Negative Pressure Wound Therapy, Overview Challenges and Perspective. So the most common results of, from studies in favor of negative pressure is that it aids in a faster healing rate, which we just discussed, and a shorter healing time. It also brings down the overall cost to a cost-effective level, even though negative pressure wound therapy is typically a more expensive um, measure per dressing. So regarding complex post-surgical or extensive acute wounds, a reduction in a hospital stay is frequently reported. Other studies um, report the timing of the treatment matters, so early treatment is more effective than late. You're gonna hear us say this over and over again, we often hear clinicians say that they wait until they failed other therapies to initiate it. And so I think that's one of our driving factors here today. Um, I'm just gonna do an overview of seven studies comparing negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell with negative pressure wound therapy with um, standard or other standard. However, there's no randomized control trials within this document. 
Uh, this just shows that the number of articles published um, both on closed negative pressure as well as negative pressure wound therapy with installation in peer-reviewed journals has really increased over the last two years. So the red columns is what I'd like you to highlight, and that's the number per year for the installation uh, with negative pressure literature. The bright red portion of comparing trials in absolute numbers. So Gabriel in 2008 did a retrospective quality control. Um, it was 15 with negative pressure wound therapy with installation plus 15 with standard moist wound care. They used polyhexanide for the installation. Um, the installation group required fewer treatment days, cleared the clinical infection earlier, had wounds closed earlier, and also had fewer hospital stays. Goss in 2012 did a prospective pilot study in which he compared eight sharp surgical debridement wounds um, with installation therapy by eight sharp surgical debridement wounds followed by negative pressure wound therapy. In the installation group, they used quarter street strength bleach solution. Um, what I'd like to highlight is that there was a statistically significant reduction in the absolute bio burden in the wounds treated with the installation. Gabriel, again in um, 2014, did a retrospective analysis of a cohort study, um, hypothetical economic model using cost assumptions. There was 34 with negative pressure wound therapy and 48 with the installation. The fluids was a mix between saline and polyhexanine. The hypothetical economic model really showed the potential average reduction of $8,143 for operating room debridements between the installation and dwell group and the traditional negative pressure wood therapy group, meaning that traditional negative pressure actually cost more than the installation group. And then Kim in 2014 also did a retrospective um, cohort study which was um, negative pressure wound therapy versus negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell. And then that group was split into a six minute dwell and a 20 minute dwell. We basically looked at with and without installation compared those groups. So the percentage of wounds that closed before discharge and culture improvement for the gram positive bacteria was significantly higher for the six minute dwell time compared to the non-installation group. And then in 2015, he compared saline, uh, normal saline solution, to the polyhexanine plus biotin. And there was no statistical significance in the outcomes, with the exception of the time to final surgical procedure favoring normal saline solution. So I'm going to just talk to you about my first experience with negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell. So um, this was in 2015. I had a 52-year-old female patient. She was admitted with severe constipation uh, related to some psych medications that she was taking. It resulted in a bowel perforation, um, so she ended up getting an X-lap with colostomy formation. She was found to have overt fecal peritonitis, so she, they left her midline incision open uh, with the fascia closed. Um, Postoperatively, she had a very complicated course. She remained critically ill. Her wound and her stoma suffered. Um, she was on pressors in the ICU, and uh, her, her vasculature just wasn't there. So she had to undergo another laparotomy uh, with bowel resection and ileostomy formation because the stoma had actually retracted back into um, her abdominal cavity again. So that was on her original post-op day 24. About a week later, uh, wound care was consulted for her abdominal wound and her previous colostomy site um, and for ongoing wound management. And the order at that time was for Dakin's packing BID. And you can see um, the poor tissue quality within her wound base at that time with some mild surrounding erythema. So we applied negative pressure wound therapy um, as kind of a standard once things cleaned up about a few days later. Um, and we still had this kind of recalcitrant tan tissue at the base of that midline, um, which we described as fat necrosis. Um, but we often do see this kind of tissue build up along the fascial sutures in wounds that have been chronically inflamed or have significant bio burden. 
So we were using at that time collagenase against the tan tissue with white foam to cover and then black foam over top of that. At the time, the wound measured 17 and a half by nine and a half by three centimeters with about 1.2 centimeters undermining. About four days later, the tan tissue still remained at the base. She was still in ICU, had leukocytosis, hypotension. My rep at the time said, you know, we've had really good results with um, installation therapy with this fat necrosis. So I said, oh, I'll give it a shot. So we applied it and we did the standard settings of dwelling for 10 minutes with normal saline solution. Every three and a half hours we cycled and then uh, the pressure was negative 125. So after five days with the negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell, she was transferred to a step down unit. There was much less fluff within the wound base. Her wound measured 16 by eight and a half by 1.8, which was about, uh, the wound volume was cut in half. Um, and the settings remained the same. Um, then she went on another um, seven days later to a med surge unit um, the wound measured even smaller, the base was 90% pink, and she was transitioned to traditional negative pressure wound therapy at that point. She continued to show progress um, to the point where she was stepped down to local wound care with a silver alginate dressing and a cover dressing, and then eventually healed. So it's one of those things that once you try it and you see how well it works, it always kind of remains in the back of your head as the therapy that you want to use. Seeing your patients get better and seeing them improve when they were stagnant for so long um, is really a huge benefit that I've seen. So my thoughts were this therapy really made the difference in kickstarting her to healing the overall wound um, and her overall medical surgical care within the hospital setting. And I know Dr. Matthews has a lot of great insight to this and he's gonna review some of the literature and discuss some of his cases as well. Dr. Matthews? Liz Faust, thank you for that excellent review and great case presentation. I look forward to hearing more about your case presentations coming up. Uh, my name is Dr. Dutch Matthews, and I am a burn trauma surgical critical care and vascular surgeon at the Valley Wise Health uh, and the Arizona Burn Center. Um, so we're talking about the early adoption of negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell time. And previous to this, we really didn't have randomized controlled trials looking at this. Um, we, we just didn't have that data. It was severely lacking. Those of us who use it felt that there was a decided difference, but we had no proof, statistical proof or papers to show this. So there really was a need to review this and uh, then to utilize multiple studies uh, to show that this had a clinical effect using negative pressure wound therapy with the uh, installation and uh, dwell time. Therefore, a systemic literature review was completed for a very large meta-analysis study. Um, what they did was, uh, the, the, the goal really was to look at the effects and the differences between negative pressure wound therapy installation and dwell time versus just the standard care, which is just uh, the uh, negative pressure uh, wound therapy alone in, in complex wounds. There was a poster that was presented at the SAWC in spring. This was a virtual meeting, and I'm not sure everybody was able to get to see this. Uh, had we been in person, it may have been a different story, but Anyway, here we were in July 2020 as a result of the current pandemic doing this virtually. And Dr. Uh, Alan Gabriel and Paul Kim, they, they looked at this by looking at all of these studies to see what did this uh, installation with this dwell time actually mean for the standard wounds as opposed to standard of care, which is just the negative pressure wound therapy. They took a number of studies uh, there was a large subset of uh, papers that had been completed, and they started looking at the weighted difference in terms of the statistics with odds ratios and confidence intervals that we're very familiar with at a 95% to confidence level. Um, they used the uh, uh, PRISMA guidelines, 
uh, which stands for the preferred reporting items for systemic reviews and meta-analysis. And they ended up with these 13 studies, which housed within them 720 patients in this analysis. And the results were very, very strong. They're very favorable towards the negative pressure wound therapy with installation and or irrigation and dwell time. It, it was so positive that uh, it actually exceeded their expectations uh, being uh, with a p-value of 0 0.01. And uh, the wounds uh, that were in the negative pressure wound therapy with this installation and dwell time, they found out were ready for closure compared to the control wounds at 0.03. Uh, for a p-value. So very, very good statistical data. Uh, here is some of the data, some of the information that they looked at in rows and columns. Uh, we let, they looked at the number of surgical debridements, the time to uh, the final surgical procedure, uh, the length of the therapy, the number of wounds, and then uh, the subjects, as well as the length of hospital stay. And they put that in all the way across. And if you look at the, the very second to last call in the p-values, we're seeing very statistically significant numbers, including one uh, for the subjects with a bacterial uh, count decrease. So the, the really almost like the rate of infection, if you will, had the ultimate significant at 0 0.0003. So uh, this showed that the installation with the um, uh, dwell time was really do, was very, very effective. Um, the odds of reducing a bacterial count, again, ultimate significance. Uh, the percent of reduction uh, was evident in all studies that captured that endpoint. So they're really um, figuring out as a result of that poster presentation that this uh, installation and dwell time is having a remarkable effect on wounds. Um, that uh, the installation and uh, dwell times had a 2.39% uh, more likelihood of closure and that a significant decrease in the length of time for these patients as well. Also very significant, one and a half days versus three and a half days, which would make our financial people uh, very happy that we were able to get patients out of the hospital much quicker. So these are some of the, the final things they came up with, with the negative uh, pressure wound therapy installation and dwell time. When used in conjunction with good clinical practice, meaning the use of antibiotics, uh, debriding the wound, et cetera, uh, compared to control groups, that the number of surgical debridements uh, during therapy would actually decrease, uh, that the time to readiness for a, a final wound closure was actually decreased, Duration of therapy decreased. Uh, there were a number of wounds that were closed and closed faster, and that we actually decreased the amount of bio burden of, uh, it within these wounds. Then Dr. Paul Kim, uh, Dr. Silverman, and uh, Dr. Adinger, they, they came out with this paper. Um, it's called the comparison of negative pressure wound therapy with and without installation of saline in the management of infected wounds. Uh, they went ahead and uh, they did this nice uh, study with the, just using uh, one doctor's data from one hospital and looked at the negative pressure wound therapy installation and dwell time uh, with this periodic installation uh, on top of the wounds uh, coupled with the negative pressure wound therapy with the objective of trying to find poten potential differences in wound outcomes of uh, using just the standard therapy, negative pressure wound therapy versus this uh, installation and dwell time. So uh, they took uh, some pool data that they had uh, from this one doctor, from these two independent studies at this, again, a single institution. They had 74 patients with the standard care, which is just the negative pressure wound therapy versus those that had the installation and dwell time, which were 42 patients. They looked at all the demographics across the board, comorbidities, uh, the wound ideologies, the locations, uh, even in a, in a very, very nice, but very simple paper out of the Curious Journal. Um, and there was only one thing that fell out, which was that in the negative pressure wound therapy group, 
there were a higher incidence of end-stage renal disease patients. Um, so that was one caveat that they had to this. Now, I would like to see what would happen in those patients because those are the patients we see, as well as the diabetics, et cetera, and smokers and people with uh, cardiovascular disease. So it would be nice to one day get those included in here, but except for that one caveat, all the uh, demographics across all the patients were equivalent. This is what they broke down inside of that Curious Journal article. And here's some of the more data from that article. But getting down into the weeds, let's just talk about the results in this fashion. Um, they found that there were, again, a lower number of operations. Look at the p-value there at 0 0.0048. A shorter length of stay at, again, 0 0.0443, again, below their standard of uh, 0 0.05. Um, shorter time to final surgical procedure, ultimate significance, 0 0.0001 and then a higher percentage of closed wounds at 0 0.0004, and then a higher percentage of wounds that remain closed at a month. So generally when we speak about at a month, that's probably what you're gonna have forever. And so patients do much better with this installation and with this dwell time. We can see here, if we just look at the uh, bacterial uh, debridement or the bacterial counts here, uh, we can see how much it drops. Um, the uh, purple is the uh, negative pressure wound therapy with installation, and the blue is uh, the standard uh, uh, treatment. And we can see how that even with the installation and debridement after the first uh, dressing change, and then looking at the difference between the two, there is a major difference once you start instilling the, uh, ir uh, the irrigants, the normal saline, into the wound vac or this negative pressure wound therapy device, uh, you can see this big drop off. And so this really started driving the picture home in that, in that study. So the conclusion from Dr. Kim's um, and Adiger's paper, uh, Dr. Silverman's paper, was that the, the management of the infected wounds with this installation and dwell time using saline leads to a favorable wound outcome uh, when compared to those managed with negative pressure wound therapy alone. So if you have a dirty wound, you have a wound that's been debrided and your antibiotics are on and you're going into your second operation, et cetera, I, this is what I do. I put these patients with installation and debridement. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, device and an adjunct with that device. And I really take the lead from Dr. Tiot's paper from France, which is where I think this data really comes from uh, or springs from. So let's go into some case studies. So I'll show you what I do. A 52 year old male had a cooking incident, burned his uh, right leg and knee with some hot food. Uh, he had a third degree burn, so 4% around this knee. And of course, uh, you know, patients try to do things at home and treat themselves at home before they come in to see me. So I took them for a tangential excision. And then uh, after the first excision, I then second excision, I put on this reticulated open cellular foam cleanse choice device and then started irrigating through it. Uh, my preference for irrigant is hypochlorous acid, which is uh, hypochlorous acid, which is 30, 330 parts per million. I instill for 20 minutes, so it's a dwell time for 20 minutes, uh, and then it suctions out all of this at uh, negative 125 millimeters of mercury. And therefore pulling out debris, the necrotic debris, uh, it pulls out bacteria, and so uh, gets rid of pro-inflammatory mediators. Um, so he had a total of five operations, and then eventually went for a split thickness skin graft once he built up enough of a plane of a granulation tissue is in the hospital for about 23 days and eventually was discharged to a skilled nursing facility in that home. So let me show you his photos. Here we are after the initial debridement and I'm looking at this wound. You see both the medial and lateral projections uh, down to the level of the fat and fascia in the muscle. I always debride with uh, um, uh, hydrosurgery. Uh, I use my medium is also hypochlorous acid, uh, and so I use that to debride this entire wound base. 
Then I take my reticulated open cell foam with the through holes and then cover it with the uh, top layer of sponge. It's not a silver sponge, although it is uh, a gray color. It's not silver impregnated. Then I take that, I put it in place, reconstruct that over the top of the patient's knee, cover it with my acrylic drape or a Dermatac drape, and then use the suction for uh, the next uh, three days. And then here we are holding a seal. And then you can see my installation there of uh, the hypochlorous acid. Uh, then we had uh, case uh, study number three, uh, which is a 47 year old male, uh, high cervical spine fracture, uh, four months prior treated at another institution, went home and um, there at the hospital, he was getting this progressive sacral pressure wound. Um, so he came to us uh, and I took him to the operating room for this IND of the sacral pressure ulcer and subsequent placement of this negative pressure wound therapy uh, for installation and dwell time. Um, again, three hour cycle, 20 minute dwell time, 25 cc's of this uh, hypochlorous acid, and then the negative suction for um, a one negative 125. He had about three operations. Uh, we taught the family how to do things at home. He had one of those uh, freedom negative pressure wound therapy devices go home with him so he could leave the hospital with care by the family. And uh, he was given follow-up. Uh, he was subsequently discharged home, but unfortunately he was lost to follow-up. Here is the initial wound we can see on the left. The right is what we resected out. And then we see on the very right hand side, the what was left of that wound. And this is constantly being changed and constantly being irrigated to debride any of this loose uh, fibrinous exudate that we have there. And you can see how over the sacrum, we don't want it to be a problem by having the, the track pad over the sacrum with him lying on it or tubing going out off of the side. So we literally put it out, take the foam sponge, put it out laterally and uh, for the installation of our um, irrigant into that. Case four is a 64 year old female. A dear lady had had a cabbage two vessel uh, and subsequently had to go back for some uh, valve repair which was subsequently uh, completed. So she had essentially two operations. Unfortunately, the sternum became unstable as it was infected. And uh, with the infection, the uh, wound had to be debrided. It was debrided at, this, uh, at another facility and um, it became unstable again. So the surgeon there was uh, unsure what to do and referred the patient to us. Um, I saw the patient immediately place them in this negative pressure wound therapy, uh, irrigation and debridement with the hypochlorous acid. Uh, again, every three hours, 20 minute dwell time, 50 cc's at negative 125. Uh, the patient eventually after a couple of days uh, was uh, taken after about five days, was taken for a debridement of the sternum and a, a plastic surgery flap closure. And therefore, after that was discharged on day number three. So uh, the follow-up has been completely unremarkable, no further infections at about a month out, and she's returned back to normal activities. You will see here our initial uh, looking at this wound. I told the team, frame out the wound with some duoderm, put the cleanse choice right down over the top. If you can see this, it's actually moving and spreading apart on top of you. Uh, on top of uh, or within the patient, and the heart is right down below. So here we are with the um, uh, irrigation device and the suction device as well the, the, um, for the hypochlorous acid. Here we are uh, two days later, you can see the commodones, the tall granular uh, granulation tissue pockets, if you will, as we are debriding this uh, wound of all of this fibrinous exudate with this unstable sternum. Uh, you will also see here uh, another, another picture of that. Here we are in the operating room, uh, about ready to take this off. Uh, we take off the device, peel it off, and you can see 
the granulation tissue is trying to take over. We actually have a decrease in the amount of fibrinous exudate. And uh, here is our plastic surgeon removing some of the sternal wires and uh, also debriding the chest on the right-hand side with his rongeur. And here we have the plastic surgeon mobilizing the pectoralis major flaps to get coverage after the debridement of the sternum and then rewiring of the sternum and then closure of the um, uh, anterior portion of this uh, sternum with this muscle flap, if you will, over the top of it. She did very well, very happy with her result. And um, another success, I talked this up to negative pressure with installation. 31-year-old female, substance abuse issues, found down, cold left leg, uh, uh, for eight hours was probably down on this leg. She came to us with this tense leg, required fasciotomies, ended up receiving a left BKA by us. And uh, this remained uh, open fasciotomy sites, had some breakdown over the stump because of persistent and recurrent MRSA infection, which we do see in our people that are uh, injecting drugs. Um, every three hours, uh, we were doing the 20 minute dwell time, 25 cc's just to irrigate this out and uh, holding a pressure of negative 125 millimeters of mercury. Eventually was discharged to a skilled nursing facility, but had a length of stay with us for about uh, 51 days, uh, multiple psychiatric issues and around substance abuse. But let me show you these images here. You can see the open area of this uh, wound, a uh, very large area. We put this uh, irrigating uh, wound vac on top of it, this uh, cleanse choice. Uh, it irrigates through there, uh, again, with the irrigation and the suction after that for that 20 minute dwell time, every three hours it's going through these cycles. And here it is when it's finally sucked down on pressure. And you can see now here a couple of uh, months later with this very nice closed wound, et cetera, when she came in to see us. Case number six, 71 year old female, 2% total body surface area scald burn to the right thigh, uh, treated at another hospital and developed a recurrent cellulitis and breakdown of her uh, wound. Um, she was transferred to the Arizona Burn Center. She underwent about four operations, including linazolid for another MRSA infection, and eventually primary closure of the right thigh open wound. Uh, the negative pressure wound therapy irrigation and debridement uh, was again, the three hours uh, cycle with a 20 minute dwell time at the end of that three hours, to 25 cc's of hypochlorous acid, and then a length of stay of about 14 days total uh, before a wound closure. And eventually is discharged and we followed up in our wound care clinic. Uh, here's the uh, wound here. Uh, you see us irrigating on the right side after the excision. You can see us putting down the negative pressure wound therapy device. And then I use the Dermatac on this one, very, very nice device because it doesn't skin strip. I really like that. And then I put the irrigation device right over the top of it to instill uh, this to get better closure. And here she is in our clinic uh, about a week after to so come get some of her sutures taken out of her thigh. Did very, very well. And then a 77-year-old male with abdominal pain, secondary to a urinary retention. A couple of weeks before he came to see us at this, uh, he went to another hospital. Um, he had found on CT this periapatic mass, uh, this interabdominal fluid collection. Um, for his urinary retention and abdominal pain, he had a Foley place to drain him after a day or two and starting him in on some uh, Flomax. He felt better. He left the hospital. He didn't want anything done about his liver, but he represented in about three weeks uh, with altered mental status, difficulty breathing, increasing redness, and drainage from his right upper quadrant. And the doctors were a bit stymied. White counts elevated. They got a repeat CT scan, and that's where they found the necrotizing fasciitis and myositis as the gallbladder was fistulizing through the anterior abdominal wall. And we all have these war stories. We all have these cases that come in, um, but this was his. Um, so he was initially debrided there, started on antibiotics, and then sent to us. Uh, and I will show you what it first looked like when we took him after he was transferred to us uh, after two days, he was transferred to us, and then we took him to the operating room. This is what we see. 
you still see some cellulitis of the skin. He's got these very large open areas which are tracking and there's pus in multiple areas that we had to debreed even more. And we're looking at this and after another debridement or two, I take him and I'm looking at his wound. I'm saying, you know what? This would be a good candidate for the negative pressure with installation and dwell time. And so sure enough, here we are. And it's uh, probably his third or fourth operation. We are now um, placing our cleanse choice in, um, putting it all together. We have a thoracic wound a little bit up higher and then the thoracoabdominal wound down below. And then we're placing our top, dra uh, top sponge over the top of that with our drapes and dermatag again. And then you see the irrigation and the uh, installation uh, or the installation and the uh, suction port there on the patient's uh, chest wall. Uh, there is our hypochlorous acid again on the left going into our vac ulta. And then we see that the uh, canister is yellow and it goes down to gr uh, green. So we know we have a good seal. So here we are, uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, we've closed the uh, thoracic portion primarily, and we've been able to skin graft the uh, thoracoabdominal portion as well. And the patient did uh, quite nicely thereafter. Um, I guess we'll talk about this last case. 57 year old male, status post insect bite to his left leg. Unfortunately, he was treating it daily with heroin injections. Um, I have a feeling that really what we were looking at initially wasn't an insect bite at all, but was actually a skin popping uh, disease. Um, he was taken to the OR for an IND slash tangential excision. That was about 300 square centimeters. We were down to the fat and the fascia. Uh, we placed a negative pressure wound therapy device uh, after uh, two ORs. Uh, with uh, the irrigation being, again, the hypochlorous acid, which really is hypochlorous acid with normal saline. So it really is the normal saline combination that we're talking about that Dr. Kim and Silverman and uh, Adinger were discussing. But this, we just add the hypochlorous acid. Um, again, three-hour cycle, 20-minute dwell time, uh, 30 cc's into this wound. Had about four operations before he was ready for a skin graft. Uh, length of stay was about 10 days, and he was discharged home with follow-up. But like so many people who are addicted, uh, he continued to inject into that site. And of course, we had some skin graft issues and failures and more debridement of that wound occur as a result. We can only do so much and then give it to the patient, and then it's up to the patient to nurture it from there. But this is what we saw. Uh, this is with our second operation. We are using our uh, hydrosurgery device that I put again, the hypochlorous acid through. And uh, we then are able to get our uh, negative pressure wound therapy device in there with, for the installation and uh, debridement. And here it is, uh, the, the VAG Ulta is holding it in place with our uh, irrigation with the hypochlorous acid. Elizabeth, I think at this point, I wanna turn the um, cases over to you for a review of your uh, work in this field as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthews. Those are some great cases. And ironically, I also am going to discuss um, some great case studies with um, some IV drug abuse patients who they must just be um, prone to getting this necrotizing fasciitis. So um, I have a young 29-year-old female who has a history of IV drug abuse. She was admitted for necrotizing fasciitis in her left arm and chest wall. Uh, she was admitted in late April, and the reason that I bring this up was it was during the COVID pandemic, at least in our area in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, we were really trying to limit uh, operating room trips and uh, conserve our PPE at that time, so she had undergone five operating room trips for debridement, which include full slavage with normal saline and bacitracin within the first week. After one week, um, we were consulted and we applied negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell uh, using the hypochlorous acid solution um, in order to help treat the bacterial burden. Within one day of that application, she was transferred out of the ICU. At the next dressing change, the installation solution was then changed to a normal saline solution. So I have a slightly different practice in that I um, 
If I have a high risk of bacterial burden, I'll include hypochlorous acid solution up front, kind of kill and eradicate all that bacteria that I can within the wound base, and then convert it to a normal saline solution to simply promote that ongoing cleansing and promote granulation tissue. Uh, she only went to the OR for dressing changes due to her pain man management issues at the bedside. She went twice a week for a total of eight additional dressing changes after that initial one. Um, so her treatment included five surgical debridements with local packing, transition to installation and dwell with hypochlorous acid for 48 hours, um, negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell with normal saline for another week. Then she went um, partial closure with um, negative pressure therapy with installation and dwell with, with normal saline uh, onto a split thickness spin graft with uh, negative pressure wound therapy to bolster. Um, you know, initially walking into these cases, we know that we have six weeks to really heal these patients before they go home because we can't send patients out with IVs for six weeks of IV antibiotics once they've gotten these bad infections. So, in just reviewing her images, on the left here, you can see the quality of her tissue after those five debridements when we were just doing local packing. Um, this middle image is the wound after about 48 hours of the negative pressure wound therapy with installation with the hypochlorous acid. So you can see the tissue really perks up. Um, it turns kind of this robust red color and you get some granulation buds. And then after one week of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell, they did partial closures when in the operating room during one of her dressing changes, reapplied the negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell um, for ongoing granulation tissue formation prior to skin grafting. And she did go home with closed wounds. Unfortunately, she was readmitted for a heroin overdose after that. Case study number 10 is a 56-year-old male. He had alcoholic cirrhosis. He really came in um, complaining of fever, chills, and increasing pain in his left leg. He was diabetic, anxiety disorder, um, depression. So the patient was found to have clear drainage from two open wounds in the left leg, one in the left medial thigh and one in the left medial ankle. So he was admitted with cellulitis and general surgery was consulted on the, tw um, again, in June in the middle of kind of the pandemic for an incision and drainage of the left thigh. They explored some purulent drainage there um, and then consulted podiatry to um, perform a debridement on the left ankle. Uh, podiatric surgery performed uh, left lower extremity extensive debridement for necrotizing fasciitis of the lower leg. Um, and then the next day they were evaluated by the plastic surgery team. Um, four days after the initial operation, he underwent a second debridement with podiatry, at which time negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell. Um, and the hypochlorous acid solution was placed. And then two days later, he went for a washout of the leg, debridement of all non-viable tissue and bone with um, traditional negative pressure wound therapy by um, podiatry. This was after um, the first OR trip and debridement. They had applied povidine iodine soaked gauze to the wound base. And I'm sorry, these are a little gritty of pictures, but you can see they got down to nice, healthy bleeding tissue. And then at the next dressing change, which was at the bedside the next day, this was what the wound looked like. So it just really took a step back. And so at this time, they saw the tissue quality. You know, you can see some vessels and some nerves there. Um, they said, all right, we're going to go back to the operating room uh, for further debridement and get them down to nice, healthy healing tissue again. So when they did that, the, the decision was made then to use um, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell. Um, and because they had found more purulence within the leg, we had chosen the hypochlorous acid solution. So. Um, the next dressing change, they weren't sure what they were going to do prior to the surgery. It all depended on what it looked like. And at that time, when they took it down, they found that the wound base was really clean. There was no additional purulence. And so they applied um, an antimicrobial wound matrix against the base, which you can see within that. 
Um, unfortunately, I did not snap my picture soon enough so that you could see how clean the vase really was. Um, and then they put negative pressure wound therapy on top of that. Five days later, uh, he came to the operating room for final closure with split thickness skin graft. So for somebody who had undergone four debridements and had um, what I don't consider to be the most advanced wound care um, prior to the application of the negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell, um, and then within a week of having that, he was able to get final closure you know, we we struggle um, in healthcare with really getting these complex infected wounds closed rapidly because we're always concerned about, you know, the risk for infection. Well, especially in a patient who um, had alcoholic cirrhosis, had diabetes, had a lot of comorbidities going against him, we were able to get this patient closed so that he didn't have this lingering wound that was a potential source for readmissions, further infections, and potentially amputations. Um, I think this is my last case study. Um, again, all of these case studies were kind of right in the middle of uh, the COVID pandemic for us, and I think it really, um, when we're looking at the therapies, I chose to use therapies that had proven track records for improving patient outcomes so that the risk for readmission and the risk for additional procedures was less because we had to be very conservative during these times. So this was a 58-year-old male who um, was an active tobacco user, poorly controlled diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, had a right BKA stump that um, had cellulitis. He was found to have a fluctuant uh, SR in the posterior aspect of the stump that we unroofed at the bedside simply because he refused to go to the operating room. Um, we applied negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell with a reticulated open cell foam um, that was applied using normal saline solution. So um, we did a five minute dwell every one hour, negative 125, and we changed the dressing every 48 to 72 hours for the next seven days while he also received systemic antibiotics. So on the left is the SR that when it was intact, and then on the right is the unroofed SR. And then on the left is the um, dressing with the uh, reticulated open cell foam. I use um, barrier rings, which is an ostomy product just to help prevent periwound maceration. Um, and then after seven days of this negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell with normal saline, the wound now had 80% granulation tissue in the base, and he was transitioned to local wound care with a medical grade honey dressing as an outpatient. Um, the patient had a lot of social issues. He was part of um, our street medicine program because he didn't really have um, a house. Um, during another admission, he was found to have um, a, a closed wound with no further surgical interventions then. So he really went on to a trajectory of healing. And then just as a side note, our vascular surgeons had, um, had offered him an AKA as treatment for that wound because they didn't feel like he had the blood flow to support it. So um, this was a big win in his book. And just the last thing I want to present, uh, this was a poster that Marion Opst had presented at SAWC Spring um, Virtual, I guess. And um, this was management of non-viable tissue buildup in the abdominal wound. So that first case that I had with um, negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell, where we saw that fat necrosis along the fascial sutures, she did a comparison of two groups, one that just had negative pressure wound therapy, and then one that had negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell using that um, novel reticulated open cell foam cleanse choice um, as a way of preventing the, the buildup of that fat necrosis or that non-viable tissue. Um, and she found that the negative pressure group, all of them had non-viable tissue formation, but in the installation and dwell, dwell group, none of them formed non-viable tissue. And that the um, traditional negative pressure group also underwent debridements and had a greater length of time to healing. So now we're moving not only from starting the therapy early on, but is there the potential that we could prevent some of those unthwarted um, uh, things or complications of a wound when we use this advanced therapy early on. 
So in conclusion, in today's healthcare environment, every medical decision can be, must be, must be justified from an evidence standpoint, as well as a fiscal one, specifically nowadays. Um, and when we are evaluating that return in investment, I think that negative pressure wound therapy with installation and dwell certainly shows that the juice is worth the squeeze. So additionally, our early initiation of the therapy could show even more benefits to not only the patient, but also the entire healthcare inst institution. And the use of negative pressure wound therapy with insulation and dwell as a tool to prevent complex wounds should be further explored. At this time, we're inviting you to use the column on the right to submit any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for joining us for this presentation, and Dr. Matthews, thank you for your time as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're going to start our question and answer uh, session for this uh, uh, industry-supported symposium entitled The Value of Early Adoption of Negative Pressure Wound Therapy with Installation on Economics, uh, Efficiency, and uh, Patient Outcomes. And uh, I'm Dr. Mark Matthews, and of course, we have Elizabeth uh, Faust here, and Hi. we are going to answer some of our questions here. Elizabeth, are you all set, ready to go? Yeah, so the um, first question that we have from the audience uh, is, what concentration of hypochlorous acid do you use? Dr. Matthews? Hypochlorous acid is a wonderful invention um, that came out of uh, Fort Worth. Um, we have to remember that the uh, vector that it's put in is normal saline. And so the normal saline is a standard concentration of 0.9%. I mean, so it's standard normal saline, uh, which is the sodium and chloride. Added to that is 330 parts per million of the hypochlorous acid. Um, now, there are other companies that have different concentrations uh, that you can consider using. Um, I have not used those others, uh, but I've used the 330 parts per million, and I found that to be very effective. What I like about it is that at that concentration, it's very effective. Uh, to destroy all prokaryotic organisms within 15 to 30 seconds of sustained contact, as proven by Hibbert and uh, uh, Robson. So I agree with that. Uh, so the next question we have is, um, or I guess comment and question is, I have issues with blockages using Bosch and Insto. Uh, do you see this issue? So if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, when I first started using Bosch um, with my uh, Vacveriflow therapy, we did see some blockage alarms uh, occur initially. So we found two strategies that really helped with that. So um, the first was that we used the Duo trackpad um, that comes with the large Veriflow kits or is sold in addition, like as a separate SKU. Um, you can swap out the trackpad so that the, um, the installation port would be um, separate from the negative pressure port. And for some reason, having those two farther away from one another was beneficial in decreasing the blockage alarms. Um, the other thing that I found beneficial is that we use um, Vosh for 24 hours and then we'll switch to saline solution with our thought process being um, once we've killed the bacteria that our goal is then to continually cleanse it and promote granulation tissue. Um, you know, there have been a few patients that we've used continuous Vosh on. Um, or we'll wait till the end of the bottle um, just to get the most benefits out of it. Um, but the blockage alarms have significantly decreased because of those two strategies. Um, do you have anything else to add, Dr. Matthews? No, I concur with you, um, Elizabeth. I think that uh, if you've debrided the wound and you started your antibiotics and you have an infected wound, you know, the, the Vosh wound solution for 24 hours is fine. But once you get that infection under control, certainly switching over to normal saline and using the duo track is a wonderful way to go. So I would, I would agree with everything you just said. Yeah, great. 
Um, the next question I see are in uh, difficult body regions or weight bearing areas um, where maintaining a seal can be difficult with the instill. What is your best trick for avoiding leaks with the instill? Um, Dr. Matthews, do you want to take that first or you want me to? Sure. I, I'll just say this. Um, just don't reinforce your dressing. Mm -hmm. Try to figure out what's wrong. Um, is there um, too much volume? Is there, uh, is the patient rolling that up when they're in their bed and they're sliding across their mattress? What's the issue? Or is it occluded with blood? Are you bleeding underneath that? And so you're, you're adding volume in and it's just sitting there. And so when you add more volume in, it eventually starts leaking. So just don't reinforce it. Try to investigate what's going on. Yeah, I agree with you that um, really a leak is just a symptom of an etiology. So either it's the drape isn't laid well, we haven't used um, an appropriate, um, I use a lot of barrier rings or like a hydrocolloid ring um, to help create a, a better seal if the skin is denuded or if there's um, a crack or a crevice that's close by. Um, or if you're on like a plantar foot and you're worried about the um, skin becoming moist from sweating. Um, or the other thing with leaks is that um, you're overfilling. And so I, I see that as well. So um, I think um, the, the easy answer is find, find the cause of the leak. Um, some strategies for difficult areas are like... Um, are using the hydrocolloid rings or the barrier rings. And then uh, if there's a crease, I always crisscross it. So I lay a piece of drape each way so that no matter when, which way they move, they'll, um, they'll have a drape that's securing it down. And then always putting the installation port higher um, so that it's kind of at the top of the mountain because you really need gravity to get it. You don't want to put the installation port at the lowest point on the wound because then you're not truly filling the foam with the um, installation solution. Um, I know there is a current dialogues um, supplement that went out about uh, like difficult um, locations or larger wounds and strategies on how to mitigate any um, issues and strategies for application. Uh, I think that's available online. I'm sure any um, 3M KCI rep could also guide you in the right direction that way. I like that. Um, and I see one more question. Um, when was that readmission where the wound was closed in comparison to last known visit where it was 80% granulated? Is that your case? Yeah, I, th I think it is. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the dear lady wanted to uh, go home for the holidays. It was... Uh, how are you going to, you know, uh, say no, you know, Christmas is coming up. And um, oh. so it's, a, it's, a, it's New Year's is right after that. And she said, you know what, let, I want to go home and uh, let me just take care of it home. So she stayed out for a little while. And I finally got on the telephone. Uh, it's about six weeks later. And I said, you know, dear Mrs. I listen, I love you. And I, I don't want, you know, we, we went through all of this with your foot and we were, we were on the cusp of saving it. Would you please come back in and just, just let me put this last skin graft down on there. And she said, oh, okay, well, can I do it in two weeks? Because I've got some other financial things I got to deal with. And I said, absolutely. So we made a deal and she came in and uh, she had a, a good, good result, but it was about a couple of weeks. It was about uh, four to six weeks in there that she decided not to come back in because she had other things to deal with. And I understand that. Okay. All right, do we have anything else or is that it? I think that's it for questions. Um... Okay. All right, so let me, uh, let me finish up by thanking everybody for uh, being here, including you, um, Elizabeth Faust. I, very, very kind of you and great insight into everything. And for everybody sitting here for this symposium,